poll is asking you, what are you looking forward to learning today? So there are different questions. If you haven't voted yet, um, seven people out of nine have voted. So looking forward to your feedback there. So we'll get started. So we're covering three different topics. And the first one is definitely on rediscovering yourself. How do we reimagine? How do we re-envision um, who we are? Because many times most of us forget about who we are. We get lost along the way. Our vision gets blurred or we try to change into something we're not. And part of the self-discovery is that journey, is that journey of trying to figure out who we are. So I'm gonna give you practical tips on how you can actually find out who you are as part of discovering yourself. So number one is ask yourself this question, what are your values? It really starts with your value system. Because when we start compromising with our value system, that's when we lose our identity. So when you bring out your ID book and your passport, does it say, who you are is represented in that image. And when people try to put a picture of someone else, then they're denied access. They're saying, but that's not who you are. You are saying that you are a tall, blonde man, and yet you are this short African woman. So what you're saying is not what we see. So make sure that you are going back to your value system, which match with who your identity is part of. So part of your value system could be you're a person that you've always been a person that's caring, a person that's built a lot of their principles on caring for others, caring for community, caring for yourself, caring for um, maybe the elderly. So that's part of your value system. So that means that you're connected to community service is important to you. And then part of your value system could be built on um, helping others. You're just a servant. You know, you love to serve others. You like to build others up. Or maybe part of your value system is really saying it's about integrity. Anything that I do, it has to be integrous. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to be corrupt in the way I approach business or the way I exchange relationship, maybe in a network for business or for friendships or family. So make sure you reevaluate your value system. It's so important because that drives your behavior. It drives your commitment in your journey of self-discovery. Because when your person says, you know what, I value my health and wellness. So I'm not going to expose myself to toxic environments. I'm going to eat healthy. So part of self-discovery is maybe I don't feel good about my weight. I don't feel good about my body. So part of it might be to re boost your energy, your immune system by eating the right products. So number one, value system. So number two, another thing that you need to do is do this simple exercise of journaling. So how many of you, maybe we'll just ask you to just put on the chat, have a journal or actively journaling. So we'll just see what people say. So I wanna know if you have a journal. So I have many journals. And this has been my 2021. So I create, I had like a nice blank one. So I journal in this one. So I've marked it 2020. And my theme word for my journal this year is rise up. So you might buy, a, I love nice um, journals as well. You can go to um, stationery stores and get yourself some colorful ones, some with flowers. So I love any kind of beautifully decorated ones. So make sure you're journaling. Journaling allows you time to reflect. It allows you to jot down your thoughts about yourself, especially when you start feeling like I've lost who I am. When you reflect back to some of the things that you've written down, it helps you to discover and say, wait a minute, when I wrote this um, thought process or this dream or this idea, I was in a good space. I was in a happy space. Why, why was I happy? Maybe I was in a relationship. Okay, if I was in a relationship, so does it mean that my self-worth or my self-identity is triggered in external factors? Because now I'm assessing where I am right now based on how I feel about myself 
and I'm comparing it maybe to when I was in a different relationship. Maybe now I'm not in a relationship and maybe that part is triggering why you don't feel like you know yourself anymore. And so do you find seek validation from other people? So maybe your value system could be, I love being around people. I love family. I love community. But let that not be your like the core reason why you find your identity. So if we strip that away from everything, will you still be happy with yourself? So having people and caring for people can help you understand, like, I love being in the company of someone good. I love being in the company of friendships. I love being in the company of healthy minded people. But one thing that I won't do is allow yeah, to do. So that's important for you to know. So we said, number one, have values. Number two, keep a journal. A journal, you record your thoughts, your day, what you're going through, your anger, your disappointments, whatever it is that you need to just offload. And then when you reflect back to it without judgment, it's just understanding and observing what triggers you. And then if you need to unpack that and you find that it's not empowering you to feel a sense of self-worth, then you now need to ask more questions. So part of the reflection is asking yourself more questions. I would like you to lean in and spend time in acknowledging your presence and your existence by looking at yourself in the mirror. So when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, I would highly recommend that you just look at your teeth, you know, see the structure of every tooth, whether they're crooked, whether they're straight, whether they pearly white or whether they've got coffee stains or smoke stains just observe it yourself really kind of acknowledge your existence because when you wake up in the morning you are alive you made it for another day you didn't die in your sleep but part of having that self-discovery is just kind of being mindful in the, every activity that you do something basic as brushing your teeth so that's an activity that you can do and feeling the taste of the toothpaste, smelling the taste maybe of the wash, you know, mouthwash, or the water, you know, whether it's warm or cold that you use, just be present. And that's part of acknowledging you because many times we go out during the day and expect other people to notice us and acknowledge us, yet we've not even acknowledged ourselves. So part of self-discovery is who am I? How do I wake up in the morning? Are my eyes puffy in the morning? Um, do I have crust around my eyes? You know, so when you wash it, oh my goodness, I've noticed I've got a breakout. And it's also understanding what's going on with your body because maybe you're stressed out and you're breaking out. So maybe you need to drink more water. Maybe you need to eat more healthier foods and products. So that could be part of it. So one of the things that you need to do as part of self-discovery is also taking time to really go through what you think about yourself. So again, back to the mirror, maybe you're getting dressed. It's good to just stand in front of the mirror and say, okay, Rebecca, describe yourself. So I would like to encourage you in your journal is maybe um, write down what you think about yourself. Just what you think about yourself from a personality perspective, your character. What is your character like? So many, many times we forget that we are not necessarily just all about our physical appearance. Start with your personality. I'm a giving person. I'm generous. I'm patient. You know, describe yourself. Because many times part of self-discovery, when we've lost our way and lost ourselves, is because we compare ourselves to other people. We worry about what other people say about ourselves. And then at the end of the day, we start almost diluting the fact that we are quite people who are valuable. We are individuals who bring a lot to the table. We're intelligent, but we've believed a lie or we're colluding with people who are painting a different story about us. So own your identity, own who you are as part of self-discovery saying, wait a minute, I am creative. I am a joyful person. I'm happy, you know, I'm forgiving or I'm, you know, Sometimes I'm, I'm sassy. I'm not going to be walked all over. So you need to acknowledge who you are from a non-tangible kind of um, personality type um, attributes. And then also look at yourself in the mirror and say, start analyzing how you look. 
I'm tall, I've light in complexion, I'm dark in complexion, I've got big eyes, you know, or I'm, so just kind of describe, take yourself through that process of being comfortable in seeing yourself. So, and accepting everything about yourself, you know, maybe you've got big hips, maybe you've got um, small boobs, maybe you've got big shoulders, or maybe you've got short, narrow shoulders, whatever it is. So I'd love for you to type in the chat as well, um, where, you know, some of the qualities that you, you actually like, kind of like don't like about yourself when you look in the mirror or you avoid the mirror because of that. Maybe there's something, maybe it's your height, it's your blemishes like I've got blemishes that I sometimes like I'm okay with them sometimes I'm not okay with them so what it what are some of the things that kind of like hmm, I'm not too happy or too keen about these um, qualities about myself so on the first question that I'd asked I asked if people have journals and so someone said I have a journal but not active and so a journal become your best friend as part of your journey of self-discovery and self-improvement trust me because i've had to look back at some of the journaling that i did i saw an entry that i put down in 2011 2011 and some of my concerns and fears um i look back i was like wow i was worried about this thing and now when i fast forward it's 2020 that that area of my life is no longer worrying i was able to overcome that but but reflecting on that, it helped me understand what space I was in as a person. And part of self-discovery is also reminding yourself, like, you've come a long way. You know, look, you're doing better than you think you are. Look at you. you maybe you feel uncomfortable with the way you look, but look at you. You've actually maybe have helped to manage maybe your, um, your skin condition, maybe because it was a breakup because of too much fat that you're eating. Maybe you've got high cholesterol levels. So just try to also kind of factor in the, rea the facts of why you feel the way you feel when you feel disconnected with yourself. And part of reconnecting with yourself is really about saying, I don't feel like I'm one with my body. You know, like my body feels something else and my, my mind feels something else. So you're not feeling empowered. So that can be a challenge as well as part of your learning journey. So in self-discovery, it's really about taking power and just saying, wait, wait a minute, how do I look and what do I see? And what am I amplifying? Am I amplifying the negative things or the positive things? And when you go back again, it's really saying, okay, now when, since I know this about myself, I tend to think about myself. Is there truth in that, in that thought? When I say I'm ugly, you know, or I'm not pretty, is there any truth in that? And normally half the time there's no truth in that because maybe it was triggered by maybe upbringing. So try to ask yourself, okay, who said I wasn't pretty? Who's, def who's got the ruler to measure the definition of pretty? So that's again, maybe you, then you find the root cause might be comparison. So someone might not have said anything, but you constantly compare yourself to other people. So here we are. So now we talked about appearance. We asked you to come to check in the mirror and kind of see things that maybe that you kind of don't like. So to, one of our panelists is saying, funny story, growing up, I hated my lips because other kids at school used to tease me. Now they're one of my favorite features because I learned to look at them and love them. Yeah, because more than likely, it's because of what kids and those kids who might have said negative things about your features, they're no longer around. They're no longer there to see you. They're no longer there to tease you. But yet you keep playing the repeat button on those negative things. So part of rediscovering yourself is trying to see what is actually founded on. A lot of it could be founded on a lot of things. And there's this beautiful song that I listened to by Leanne La Havas. Um, she's based in, in the UK and it's called um, Eggshells. And, but it's simple words. It just says underneath the eggshells is solid ground. So how many of you are walking on eggshells constantly because maybe someone keeps belittling you or because of the old thoughts and the old stories that keep playing on your mind, but each time you're trying to almost like not live or be, you know, scared to live or to stand your ground. And yet we're saying underneath all those eggshells about what you, the misconceptions about yourselves, it's just solid ground. 
to stand in the firmness and the truth of who you are. So that's part of discovering yourself and just saying, wait a minute, this is all eggshells. I can actually stand firm, crush them and own my crown and really rediscover who I am. Another thing could be your physical appearance. So if, if you've got something that bothers you about your physical appearance, then do something about it. If there's anything you can do about it. So for example, working out um, and do things that are simple. You don't have to strain yourself and be obsessed about it, but it's really about saying, you know what, this will make me feel better if I do this, but it doesn't identify me either. And I'm sure a lot of us ladies have a lot of discussions about COVID, you know, lockdown, when we couldn't get our hair done, we couldn't get our nails done, we couldn't get our brows done. I mean, I'm sure we have stories to tell about where we had to come to a level of acceptance about everything about us, you know, because many times we can cover up with a lot of things. We've got people who are quickly there to fix a lot of things. Like today, I put um, rollers in just to tighten the curls a bit. I had to put effort into it. And um, before, like natural hair, how do I learn the texture of my hair and comb through, even if it's tough or if it's like I've got curly hair, I want it straight, maybe I'm tired of blow drying. So there's a lot of things about our physical appearance that can also help us to rediscover ourselves. It's like, okay, you know what? I need to accept that this is my natural look and I should be okay to walk out the door with or without it. I think that's important. So don't allow those things to define who you are. So part of this self-discovery is also knowing that if I don't have the bells and the whistles, the glitters and the glam, I still need to accept who I am. So part of it is I don't have crutches, things that I lean on, like I love heels. And I used to think, oh, I don't like flat shoes. So that used to give me a boost of confidence, right? But when I don't have the heels, am I still the inner confident woman of who I was created to be? still showing and displaying who I am. And then lastly, um, part of self-discovery is maybe you're living in the past. That could be part of what's creating the narrative of your story of maybe not feeling like you know who you really are. So there's the nostalgia and you just think, oh, back in the good old days, good old days, I used to be at the top of my game. I used to do all these things and that can cause you to start diluting the story of not living in the present and the practice that you can actually implement in your life is mindfulness so mindfulness is really talks about filtering with no lies to yourself being honest and being present in with the state that you're in saying okay i'm here and this is how i feel i feel crappy about maybe my health and i need to take ownership and do something about it so one of the participants is saying, I'm 34 and I've been fed all my life and I try to work a uh, workout diet, et cetera, but I can't seem to lose the weight. This has been my identity from day one. It's been a journey to try and accept who I am. There are days when I feel ugly and days when I say I'm damn gorgeous. And, you know, the lady who just commented on that, I'm just telling you, there's some guys who just say, you know what, we admired like big girls, they're curvy, but the thing that makes us attracted to them is because they're confident. They just like, they are just walking in their confidence. So I just want to encourage you that, you know, sometimes there's sometimes your body structure could be um, stronger and bigger than other people. And part of it is, are you healthy? That's always my question is, if you're healthy, then don't stress. But if you know that there are things that are concerning your health, that it's diabetes or blood pressure, then those are the things that you want to take care of. And by taking care of your health, guess what? Your body just kind of falls into place to whatever size that it fits to be. And the beautiful thing about our organs of our body is that it's stretchable, isn't it? It's, it's stretchable. It can expand and it can do whatever or you tell it to go. So um, make sure that you still know that you're beautiful no matter what size you are. And because I think, like we said, back in the day, people would love you and some people would have dismissed you. But those people, they're no longer there in your life. So why do we let them have to say about ourselves? So part of it is as a person who owns their crown and part of this boot camp is really changing the self-talk towards yourself. 
because if you don't find yourself beautiful no matter what size and if you choose to go down to a few sizes it's because you want to not because you're feeling bad do it because you are motivated to say i want to be able to do splits or whatever but i've seen some great dancers who are plus size plus size models plus size fashionistas and just have fun with it um, i think that's something so admirable even people's skin color i remember traveling to ghana and there was this gorgeous lady and she was a rich dark dark skinned woman and, and she just the first thing she said to me as i greeted her she says oh my goodness i'm so dark and i just felt i just told her, i said no you are beautiful i mean she had this beautiful chocolate dark chocolate skin and she was you could see she was uncomfortable in her own skin and when you're uncomfortable in your own skin you make it uncomfortable for the other people as well but one of the things when I reminded I said you go girl you just do you because that's the way that you were created that's your color you know and it's like having an artist an artist said they has to be people of this shade of brown or let them be that way and let's make the world more beautiful and diverse so don't dismiss and some of the things that you hate about yourself and you can't change normally those are the things that are created to help you to stand out and be unique and to stand out you know and just make a mark in the world you'll be unforgettable to many people that you come across so mindfulness definitely is a practice that will help you as part of your self-discovery is to say i'm present I'm fully aware of my surroundings. I'm fully aware of what I'm doing. I can feel the texture of this mug. I can, it's heavy, it's smooth. Um, the, the handle is round. And I'm just, I'm present with the different senses that I have. So part of it being self-discovery is not to try to hide away from the world. So let's say you are, you know, at somewhere or you're just by yourself, try to remember your senses, your five senses, you know, the sense of smell. So if you're in a place, smell, you know, the environment, maybe it's a flower that you got as a gift, smell that flower. If you're making coffee and you're grinding the coffee um, beans, smell the this, 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 the aroma of that coffee, maybe it's Arabic, maybe it is, it's got a hint of hazelnut, smell it, that just wakens you up. Part of being uh, mindful and being self-aware and, and developing your self-awareness, starting to also use the sense of touch, you know, when you touch something, um, maybe when you feel something, the texture of your hair, the texture of your clothes, the texture of the, and the taste, the taste as well, make sure that you are fully aware when you're eating something, you're not just shoving food down your mouth. Take time to enjoy the meal. You know, pretend you're a magazine critique of a food, you know, recipe book and just look at the colors, the arrangement, the smells again, and the taste of it. And be grateful. Sit in gratitude about who you are and what you have in front of you. Because part of it, then you start knowing what your tastes are. Oh, I like this, you know, this doesn't taste, it tastes bitter. You know, I think I like sweet and sour. Maybe I like spicier foods. Maybe I like more bland foods. So you start to discover what you like. So part of self-discovery is sometimes we allow other people to kind of tell us what we like or should enjoy. And then lastly, part of it is also movement. So make sure that you are moving and with your sight as well. So part of the senses is what you see, what you see around you. Are you taking to cognizance where you are, how you're feeling, how you, what you're smelling, what you're touching, what you're doing, and that'll help you to kind of draw yourself back to yourself. So you need to make sure you're drawing yourself back to yourself because when you feel disjointed, is you feel your body's there, your mind is there, everything is all over the place. So whenever I would go through stressful times, that's when I'd also kind of like feel like I'm not connected with myself. I always said to myself, bring yourself back together, Rebecca, bring yourself, you know, put yourself, ground yourself, pull yourself together. Because when you start feeling like you're all over the show, you don't have much control. And obviously your identity um, is compromised. You start not knowing who you even are. So pull yourself together. And part of it is meditation. Mindfulness talks about breathing exercises, meditation, walking, and just taking time to rest your mind. 
So are you taking time to sleep? Are you taking time to recover? And we'll cover that on time management. So I don't know if anyone has any questions um, regarding um, self-discovery before we move to the next one, time management and career management. So here's so much a journal. I have an on and off relationship with my nose is my biggest um, problem. My aunt teased me and I finished all the oxygen in the room, haha. -ha. And so you found a way to laugh about it. Um, the things that I didn't like about myself, like I didn't like the sound of my voice, you know, when I was growing up, they used to say, you've got a deep voice, Rebecca. You've got a hoarse voice. You've got a boy's voice. And I'm like, so I used to keep quiet most of the time. I used to just keep quiet, didn't want to say anything. So, but now it's like I talk all the time. I do Rebecca talks. And so some of the things that we're also told are negative are actually part of that help us express who we are. So one lady saying, one thing that has helped me is defining beauty by my own standards and learning to love and flaunt what makes me unique, wake up and tell yourself every morning, even when you don't feel it, that you look amazing, dress yourself up, look at yourself and take a moment to love what you see. All right, now, by the time we walk out the door, no one will be able to bring you down, not even the mainstream ad in the world love you oh i like that one so how do you start writing in a journal i don't know what to even say right writing tips definitely oh thank you this is melodic i really soothing and beautiful and can you believe i even did a recording for music i've sung songs and did some music when i was in the states and um and even here we did some music as well. So it's amazing how sometimes when people put you down for something about an attribute about yourself, that could be your superpower. So why don't you flip the script on the world and use that as a superpower? So part of using your journal, when you get your journal, I always rem um, recommend you put a date on it because there are times when I've not dated some of my journal input and I don't remember when it was. So put a date at the top. And then just write down what you feel, what's on your mind. Maybe just a recap of your day. Um, you could be going through something where you're questioning a lot and you're just having the dialogue in your mind. But by writing down that same dialogue might allow you to really see information firsthand in front of you. So that's how I would recommend that you do that. So you're not trying to interpret, you're not trying to, you know, making a philosophy out of it all you're doing is just kind of doing it um, by just putting a drip i call it brain dump um it could be also something that made you feel happy and i started writing poetry because of that because whenever i would feel something i'm like oh my goodness this feels like you know i would have this scene in my mind which looks like a movie or some words that just sounded like so yummy you know a sentence structure and then I'll just jot it in my journal. So you'll discover quite a few things about yourself, like, oh, I actually didn't know I could write poetry. Um, so that's some, something, um, even songs, sometimes I'll write lyrics down because of how I want to express myself, but in a journal. And then another thing that I do keep is a gratitude journal as well. Um, so maybe you don't want to say deep things, you just want to reflect on things that you're grateful for. So one of the um, practices of mindfulness is definitely gratitude. So taking time to just journal, maybe you could do it at the end of the day as, a, as a, something to rest your day with. Um, so what you're thankful for, maybe you're just grateful for um, having the sunshine on your face, you're, you're grateful for family, you know, you're grateful for food to eat, water to drink. And here um, someone is saying, journaling has definitely made, been a huge help in self retrospection and when I read on those entries I see how much I've grown yeah because many times we put ourselves down we knock ourselves down feel like failures and yet when we look back it's like wait a minute I actually was navigating that situation quite wisely oh my goodness I'm wiser now I'm able to give the same input and help to somebody else in a better way all right so that takes us now to career management so now that we know who we are, um, in, and, and sometimes also part of the self-discovery, it's not just necessarily saying it's just one area of your life. It could be maybe all the areas of your life or a specific area. So for example, a lot of women have become moms 
and their title is now mom. You know, whenever they describe who they are, they say I'm a mother. Yes, that's an aspect of the things that you do, but it doesn't give you the full identity. So some of us have taken on only the identity of being a mom. So when we end up with an empty nest, we fall apart because we don't know who we are without those children. So um, what are you looking forward to learning today? So some more, um, there's a poll that's in progress again. Um, so we're gonna cover career guidance. So yeah, so we're going into that. So someone, um, was talking to me about how they wanted to change um, their lifestyle. And they were saying, Rebecca, I'm feeling frustrated, I'm feeling stuck, and I'm scared of changing my career. And um, so, and I've had people where they say they are in a career, but they wanna know how they can improve and be more effective in that career path that they're on. Or you're in an individual who's saying, you know, a little bit stagnant, I'm great at what I some individuals that I know who are um, were stayed on moms now they took on a job and now they so I was in their journey to update them on how to transition to a new career but now they're in the new career and they're getting the support that they need okay so the first thing on career planning is find out who you are so find out who you are in the work role. So it's find out who you are from an expertise level. So it's not just who you are from an identity perspective. It's just saying, when I am asked in two words to describe who I am from a professional standpoint, what do I say? Do I give a long story or do I go straight to the point? I'm an accountant. I'm a leader. I'm a scientist. I'm a specialist. So those are the things that you can actually work on, making sure that you're clear about defining who you are. Because I always compare it to saying, if I go to a store and I'm shopping, and I believe in the vegetable section, I don't expect to find handy Andy there. I don't gonna expect to find cleaning products there. I'm gonna expect to find vegetables. So make sure that when I am a recruiter and I'm in the shopping cart and I'm looking for skill sets for people with a certain skill set, I, if I ask you, what do you offer? Tell me right away. You know, I'm a student, a graduate, but I'm studying accounting. So that makes you in the field of accountant. But if you keep on saying, I'm a student, I'm a student, okay, student and what? Now you're wasting time and we're trying to discover what you offer. So try to get, be clear about who you are in the workspace. You know, are you known as a specialist? And it's okay to transition to something, but let's make sure that you know what your core skill sets are because those core skill sets will serve you in the new transition that you make, especially if you're trying to make a different transition altogether. It's also okay, but be clear about what you're strong in. Hopefully that makes sense. Then the next thing is remember your accomplishments in your past experience. So reflect back again in your past experience. And you can do that by taking out your CV and looking through it and saying, okay, these are my past experiences. I've been good at leadership. I've worked in roles of admin. I've been working in support. So for example, when I look at my, C my CV slash resume, I always find that I'm very good in multifaceted team setups. So I can work with multi-functional um, roles. So for example, support roles are good for me. So I like to work, for example, when I work for a client who was a global IT company, they offered hardware, software, services, and consulting. I was running a support group that covered all of them. So which meant I had to put on my services hat when I was dealing with the services guys, put on my hardware hat if I'm working with the hardware guys. So everything in my team that needed to be delivered, it was cross multifunctional. And that meant it was multi sector um, oriented as well. So I could work in different sectors. If you're a person that's been specializing in one sector, for example, you could say I'm very good with the, um, let's say health and health care 
sector, or I'm good at the ICT sector. So it's telecoms and IT, or someone else can say I'm in the transport industry or media. So you know that that's going to be your niche market. So part of my career planning started with me understanding that I actually love working in IT spaces. I love working with the techies. I love working with um, the telecom industry because that's where for me the fun is. You know, for me, that's like being in a shopping cart. Take me to a place where they've got cool gadgets and innovative ideas. I feel right at home. So I realized that about myself. So what have you realized about yourself concerning your career journey? Like when you look at your CV, what is it telling you? What story does it tell you? And your CV should be able to tell a story and narrative about your journey. So that's the next step. So you look through your CV. Then another thing that you want to do is now kind of like look to the future. So that's the current and the current also is saying, what role are you in? And are you performing well in that current role? So part of career planning, we always think it's all about the future. I always remind um, individual to say, you still need to be a top performer, a top co contributor in your current role, in your current position. Because what happens is that we check out of our current role and we're already looking at the new next thing. I'm bored, I'm tired, I'm not enjoying this. I, I need something different or I feel, you know, we start living in the future and we've checked out before it's time for us to check out. And I remember sharing on one LinkedIn um, article that I did, it was really saying, have you finished the assignment before you check out? You know, it's because sometimes we, and yes, I might not finish the whole, um, solve all the problems in that organization, but I finished the assignment that I need to finish. So make sure that you, fulfill the assignment that you're there for and then you move on but part of while you before you move on you prepare and plan for that transition and it could be long term short term or immediate mid term as well so immediate goal says how am i performing in my current role am i fully present do i know the ins and outs do they trust me as a trusted advisor am i called on to stand in for my manager when he's so that means that I'm a person that is, when they look to promote me for the next opportunity, they do see me on their radar. So I'm not invisible to them. And like when I'm not really looking through and, and performing in my current role and I'm already looking to the future, what happens is that I miss out on being considered as a potential candidate for the next opportunity. Because they're saying, Rebecca doesn't perform, Rebecca's disengaged, Rebecca's not collaborating with others, because I've checked out mentally before it was time for me to check out. So make sure that you're cognizant of the impact that you're having in your current role. And so your CV needs to tell a story, and it's so true, because um, many times we put roles like, number one, um, I did admin, and then, and it's like, I'm reading a machine, a description of a machine, where you know and and i don't even know like what does it so what okay you're saying that you did reports on a monthly basis what did those reports do you know so the story behind those reports is saying i was able to contribute to the business management and keeping the forecasting of the stats in order for us to keep in track of our revenue or our target of our deliverables or track whatever systems issues that we had or maybe we were able to under, find potential problems that we're able to solve ahead of time because of the data so part of being um, an individual that's planning for their career you're able to give data-driven conversations you're able to bring innovation and contribute to the department so let's say if you're a person that does reports Part of it, as part of your CV, you could say delivering monthly reports, managing to ensure that we forecast our sales numbers accurately and be able to meet our revenue figures at the end of the year or end of the quarter. So that could be the way. So now I understand, oh, okay, this report actually had, is very important. Um, so, and I love to give this story and I, some of you have heard it before. Wait, on your CV, you should tell me a story. So there are two, for, let's take a, an example. Let's imagine we're builders and there are two groups. One group is asked by these tourists and they're saying, what are you doing here? 
and then I'll say, oh my goodness, I'm just taking bricks from this corner to that corner. And then they ask Sophia's team and they say, Sophia, what's your group doing? She says, oh my goodness, we're part of an amazing vision. We're helping build the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital. Can you believe I get to be part of this visionary team? You see the two differences. They're all bringing bricks from one corner to the other, but it's how I see and understand the why behind what I do. So some of us also have kind of disengaged from our current positions and current roles, mainly because we have lost the understanding of the why, the why behind what we actually do. So your CV can be much more richer if it's able to portray a story that's more meaningful and deeper. It doesn't have to be flowery, but it's actually giving the supporting facts of what the impact. And I used to do performance reviews as um, a senior manager and I used to have, get escalations from another manager say okay my employee doesn't want to you know agree with my performance review for them now I had to intervene before we take it to HR and one of the things that I actually understood when sometimes having conversations with some of the individuals or the manager was that they didn't understand the their business commitment goals so part of the business commitment goals shows that if you deliver on them, then that helps you to know what you've achieved. So if they didn't understand the business commitments and to say, how does this actually impact the business? So they thought, oh, I'm just doing my job. So that means I'm a top performer and which is wrong. If you are doing your job, you're doing your job. We hired you, you said your CV can do this. And then we hired you, you're doing the job, you're getting paid for what you do. So I'm not giving you anything more nothing less but if you're not performing and contributing your optimum best that means that you are and you need to improve the areas of improvement but when i understand the business commitment that i make to a certain organization i'm able to articulate myself and say because i was able to come up with an idea a process an improvement plan or i was project managing this and i was the leader of the project I was able to come up with efficiencies and improve the way we do things. Or we went through an audit and I was the main person that had to deliver on the audit reviews. And I was able to make sure that we were on time. We didn't miss out on some of the evidence that they were asking for because we had a system that tracks and stop, you know, everything, the processes and make sure that we are on point. So I think that's where we miss out. We just think I'm just helping the audit team. You know, I had to do admin, I had to send emails, but what is the why behind it? So I saw that on the toll, someone was saying, my CV needs to tell a story. So the same thing which takes us now to LinkedIn, go back to your LinkedIn profile. Your picture should sell, tell a story. Because sometimes people put in on their picture profiles, picture where they were still a graduate, when they were still, you know, in university, or they put a picture where they're with their hubby, their wedding picture, or they're putting a picture when they're wearing like a top, when they're at the beach, and they're like, um, they're wearing sunglasses as well, or there's no picture. There's no picture, there's like nothing there. So your LinkedIn profile should also tell a story because that's a digital, almost like a digital card that people are looking at remotely to see if they, they need to hire you and because recruiters are looking they're window shopping and if you're window shopping you know you want something to stand out to you and then when it stands out at you then you're like okay now i'm going to go to the store and be and buy and purchase but if something doesn't stand out for me at the window i'm going to keep walking to the next door maybe that store actually had something that i needed so you're saying pick me i'm the right employee for you but also your manager your current manager needs to see what you offer as well. So make sure that your profile is up to date, especially your internal company profiles, because there's an external one, the LinkedIn profiles, but also internally. Some of you have company directories, you have um, where they ask you to put a summary of your position, each time you change your role, make sure that's up to date. Make sure that is up to date, it's telling us a story and the picture should be there so people can see what you look like and the picture should tell a story. So one lady will send me two pictures and just said, Rebecca, which one should I post? So I asked her to describe that picture to me. I said, okay, pretend you're the recruiter and you're looking at that picture. What would you say about that individual? Would you hire them? 
yes or no? And she's like, hmm, she looks like she's not serious. She looks more laid back. I like the other picture. She looks like she means business. She looks like she's ready to take on the world. So part of your career management and planning is also to understand what story you're telling. Maybe you are not visible in the office. Maybe you're not telling the story that you are actually a candidate that's the best fit for that position because you're not expressing yourself in the meetings. So part of career planning is saying, how am I showing up in my current position so that I know how to show up in my next position? And then the next thing that you want to do is update your CV. After you've done research on the career that you plan on moving into. So long term could be, I want to be a CFO. But before I become a CFO, I need to be an executive in finance for one of the departments. Before I become an executive, I need to become a senior manager. And before I become a senior manager, I need to become a middle manager. And before I become a middle manager, maybe I need to become a team leader. So you kind of like now work it backwards. So you then you start looking for opportunities to move that path. So that's a straightforward path. Then another thing that you need to consider is to say, okay, how do I navigate within the organization to, to get opportunities? So networking is important. And asking questions, hey, you know, you're the CFO here. Please tell me how you got to where you are. Tell me how you were able to navigate and do what you did. And so I love this question that's coming up. It says, do you have an up-to-date LinkedIn profile? So 33% are saying yes. Um, 56% have said, actually, my profile is not yet up to date. And then 11% are saying, don't really use LinkedIn. Okay, so great input there. So part of your network can be fostered and helped by LinkedIn. Can you believe that? So LinkedIn is not always when you want to look for a new job. It's really about saying, I need to stay relevant in my current environment. So you can be visible for, for your internal company and visible for external recruiters. So LinkedIn is an amazing tool. So let's pretend that we go to a function or I work with someone because now we can't go to places, but because maybe if there's a conference call, I'm asked to present on the project plan. For example, if I'm the project lead, if I present on it, I know that they've got stakeholders that were invited to that conference call and the people that you're getting visibility from that you normally wouldn't have. So those people will actually be on the call. There's nothing wrong with you connecting with them on LinkedIn afterwards and say, hey, it was a great meeting today. Um, I would like to stay in touch with you. Um, you know, you, you connect with them on LinkedIn because then you're able to know if they move job roles. Um, LinkedIn updates that when someone updates their new position, you know which company they've moved to, you can stay in touch. They have people that can connect you with other people. So that's part of nurturing your network. So LinkedIn be definitely a great tool for that. So it's not just about, oh, I'm looking for a job. It's actually a business tool for on social media. And do you know that based on stats, um, women are are the highest participants in a lot of social media platforms compared to men. However, LinkedIn is the one platform where more men are active on than other social media platforms. So women use Facebook more, Instagram, but when it comes to LinkedIn, that's where the guys play. And guys, we can learn a lot from men about networking. So that's one of the tools that I highly encourage you to start utilizing. Because there you can even find your mentor. You know, you could look through the, the list of people, what they do, people that you admire, you follow them, inbox them, connect with them. They might even make time to do a call with you and you'll be surprised at how big the world is. And it's a global tool as well. So that's the beauty of it. If you're looking for a job overseas, then you can also kind of like check out what offerings are there globally. So you, we talked about number one, you're going to look at your CV, you're going to look at your LinkedIn profile, you're going to research on jobs that you're interested in. And part of researching doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to move tomorrow. It's just getting an idea of what skill sets you need to look at. So when you're looking at your CV, you see where the gaps are, then you might discover, oh my goodness, I need to do this. I'll give you an example for my personal journey. I literally came into an organization 
and I thought I wasn't like really great at it. But then I started growing and becoming confident in my job role. And then I looked around and I saw the next thing was to become, you know, a senior exec. And I was like, wow, I want to be that one day. And what I did is I started making a plan. So part of my career management plan was I wrote down my goal. I wrote down the goal was to become an executive. I wanted to manage managers. I wanted to manage a large portfolio. And I wrote that down. And then the other thing that I did, I put timelines as to when I thought it would be possible to me for me to join those positions. And I put four years. So it was a four year goal. And then the next step I did was I looked at different jobs. I didn't know what position exactly, but I knew something about myself is I love people. I love managing people. So there are people who can be managers and they're task managers and you can just manage projects or manage technical environments and not necessarily be a people manager. But I always love the aspect of technical roles with people management involved. So that was the next thing. So I wrote that down and then I put the four-year goal. And then I realized the areas that I was researching in, there was more requirements on service management and project management. So I kept on doing research on that. Then I realized I actually didn't have the certification for project management and service management. So I wrote down as a goal again, to study those and get certification on them. So that's how I started closing the gap. So many times we look at where we want to go career wise and where we currently are and we see a huge gap and we get frustrated and we give up on that and disqualify ourselves from applying from the, for those positions. But what can we do in the meantime is to study. So internally there were training programs which are online. I started taking those online classes and then I wrote the certification and boom, I was done. I didn't ask my manager for permission because it was kind of available for us at that time. But the other thing is that it did not interfere with my everyday work. So I was able to do that during my spare time. One of the things that, because I was a working mom of three, I realized I needed to come into the office a few hours early. So I would come in, let's say an hour early or 30 minutes early. So as long as you put in at least 20 minutes, um, of studying. Uh, you can also see that you're hours of learning. You can do it in bite sizes. So that's how I did my learning. So that's where from there, I was able to get that to, and in two years, the opportunity opened up and I went and applied and guess what it required? It required service management, it required project management, and I got the job. I got the job in two years instead of four that I thought. So that's part of the beauty of career planning as well, is that you're not really surprised when it happens, but it's so you them too, but when they do happen, you know you are preparing and you're ready for it. So don't accept delay denial. Uh, kind of so that for me was like quite a, a beautiful story from my personal life where I just saw it actually happen in my life. So that's the power of career planning. So I started planning that. So one of the things I did was I worked on the skill sets that I wasn't strong in and I got a mentor. And one of the things that I realized about myself was that I didn't have male mentors. I always had women mentors. So I called on um, one lead that was based in the UK and um, he helped me a lot. He challenged my brain because I was more on the strong on the softer side and then business acumen, he kind of like just pull that out of me. He would ask me tough questions and my brain would be like, oh, I don't know. And then I'll go do homework and research. And before I knew it, I became comfortable with topics like strategy, you know, topics on budget, topics on um, stats, you know, which comes to this management that I needed in that promotion. So I told you that I wanted to be a manager, a senior exec, and I actually had eight people who were managers who were reporting to me. 
and the whole team itself was uh, comprised of about 400 individuals, which was technical. Delivery for to what is based. So you can imagine this was me living out what I had put down on my career planning to do. And one of the things that I did was I made sure that I trusted the people around me, I helped the people around me, I led the team around me, and I was able to upskill. So that's part of the research that you need to do is find out what skill sets you have gaps for. So do you have a mentor? Yes. So that's part of the poll that's up now. We're just asking everybody to tell us if you have had a mentor before or not. And it makes a huge difference. Uh, trust me, when it comes to career planning, it's so critical because they give. So and also there's a difference between a mentor. Um, there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. So when you're doing your career planning, especially if you work for a large organization, make sure you communicate with your leadership team, whether it's your manager, and find out and connect. So part of networking as well is you network with people who can sponsor your career development because they'll vouch for you. They'll be able to sit in that boardroom and you're not in that boardroom and they're talking about career succession planning. Someone else will speak on your behalf. They say, wow, we've seen Sophia, we've seen Tendai, we've seen Rebecca. She is a go-getter. They'll say, how do you know that? Oh no, because she's worked on some of my projects or her project impacted my team. So she had to work with us. So those are, that's how your, um, your credibility can be built as well. So a sponsor is someone who will vouch for you and has the authority to make a decision for your promotion or your opportunity. Um, that's a decision maker. So like, for example, you know, the hiring manager or an executive. can do support you and cheer you on, but they might not have any influence whatsoever on the hiring decision or know the, you know, where you want to go. They just did for, for moral support. Or you could have two in one if you if you're um, fortunate to get that. So make sure that you understand because a lot of women um, tend to have a lot of mentors but not enough sponsors. So sponsors are like your your you know the approvers and they might not be able to change or get you hired but they're able to have a voice um, that's quite trusted and of weight. Okay, and then lastly as part of your planning is make sure that you start doing um, things that give you visibility. So projects, for example, you can volunteer, you can freelance. So for example, I know someone where they wanted to move into um, a different role. So instead of like quitting their job, they started doing freelancing on the side to upskill themselves in the new career path that they wanted to move into. So make sure that you're not just getting stuck and feeling like, well, I haven't got the job yet. Try to do certain things. So part of it is learning through the books. Another way is doing. Another way can be freelancing. Another way can be volunteering. So there are different facets of um, in the world you know, what, that are open for you to learning um, the new skill that you want to go into. In last career management in your current position is in enjoying ride enjoy the ride of your current career and each career has different areas that are not fun so there's some things that you don't enjoy there's some things that you just hate and you're thinking to yourself i do not like the admin aspect of this i don't enjoy so make sure that you are not you know kind of like confusing yourself with things aspects that you don't like and then thinking you actually hate the job. Maybe you actually are built for that job. It's just that you hate the admin aspect. You hate the, the pressure that comes at month end. And I used to say to some teams, you know, when it comes to month end pressure, it's month end pressure. So you can't change anything about it, but there is also quiet time during the beginning of the month, the middle of the month, but end of the month, the pressure's on. So don't hate your job and quit on the fact that you know, you're not happy it's month end. So that's not what the job is all about. So I hope that makes sense because many times um, some of us don't choose jobs because we believe that this is going to be, you know, frustrating. It comes with the territory. Office politics comes with the territory. 
um, pressure comes with the territory. So you just need to accept the fact of the nature of the job. I remember having a discussion with a mentor of mine. I said, I want a job where I'm not having to deal with putting out fires and, you know, and then he just said, Rebecca, that's the nature of the, there's no good, when you find that job, you call me, you know, and I thought, oh, I'll definitely look for that job. And it doesn't exist. You know, there's always volatility, there's uncertainty, there's disruption, even like the COVID pandemic, you know, it's disrupted a lot of people concerning the career planning as well. And they're thinking, how do I plan for my career, especially now? So part of the things you can start doing is saying, how do I learn to work online? How do I learn to work remotely? How do I learn to communicate in a stronger way? How do I update my LinkedIn profile? Because no one is walking around and handing out business cards, but they're definitely looking for people on LinkedIn. And your profile for your LinkedIn needs to be catchy, it needs to be relevant, and you need to showcase what you're offering. So don't tell us a whole history about what your motivation is. Give us the facts. What can you offer? I'm looking for an accountant. Are you the accountant that I'm looking for? And can you do what we need for you to do? And so also adapt your CV as well um, to the nature of the job that you're looking for. If they keep emphasizing organizational skills, if they emphasize strong communication skills, make sure on your CV it's reflective. Because many times when I'm coaching people, I do personal career coaching as well for individuals. And sometimes when we start reviewing the CV, they kind of like discover like, oh, no wonder they're offering me junior jobs. is because my CV is saying nothing about the senior experience that I've had in the past year. All I'm doing is telling them that I'm a graduate. All I'm doing is telling them that I'm a junior person. So make sure that you are reflecting what you want to attract. And that's part of career management. And take a leap on, you know, communicating with people from all over the globe. Find out, research about whatever it is that you want to do. And, and ask for help, especially when you know you've got performance feedback and you're not doing so well. Part of the career planning is to work on yourself as well, to say, how do I improve? If someone says, hey, your reports are not up to par, you're always putting errors in there. When we're in the board meeting, we're looking at the wrong numbers, fix it, um, which means I need to prepare the report a little bit earlier. That's part of my CV. That's my brand that I'm putting out there. So I hope everyone had um, some some ideas on the career management. I don't know if anyone has any questions, feel free to um, ask. Otherwise, you're gonna go into time management because now we're saying, Rebecca, I know who I am, I'm planning my career, but where do I find the time in my current job right now and time in planning for the future? I can hardly survive you know, today, uh, today's pressure. So we'll talk about time management, okay? Any questions on career planning? Otherwise, we can save this until the end as well. So don't stress if you have questions after, that's also fine. All right. So the last thing is on time management. So if you look at time management, it seems like, oh, you know, everybody talks time management, but um, so we've got a poll question here. So we're asking you, do you have challenges in managing your time? Yes, I wear too many hats. Not really. Or I'm a professional in time management. What is it? All right. So 67, 71%. Okay. Wow. So most people are saying well, they wear too many hats. So that's where the time management factor comes into place. So it's not that, you know, the don't know how to manage time. It's just like, guys, I'm just spread thin. You know, I would say as a woman, you know, this one person, but you're having to perform different roles. You know, you're a mother, you're a sister, you're an aunt, you're an employee, you're an employer. So there's so many facets to you. And all these roles expect you to perform some kind of job role um, or some type of activity. So you're going to have to divvy up your time. So one of the activities that I will encourage you to do when you're by yourself is just to like a pie chart and I want you to allocate a percentage of time that you believe you're spending on the different aspects of your day. So kind of do, um, actually let's do that exercise now. If you have a paper and pen, um, draw a circle 
And then in that circle, try to allocate pieces of um, the chart as to how much time you spend in, in a day. So on average, how, what does your day look like? So on average, my days I wake up, I prepare, take my shower, I do meditation, then the next thing I'm in meetings. So meetings might take 40% of my time. So maybe that's you. Other people is 50%. Other people is 60%. And then you might say, okay, time for lunch. Okay, time for watching Netflix. If there's a series that you're like binging on, what time, how much time do you have? So within 24 hours, um, how much time are you spending in sleep? Or you can just chunk it up for a week and just say, okay, you know what? Throughout the whole week, I actually spend more time in watching television, social media, on the phone, children, you know, that kind of thing. So I would encourage you to do that. And so it's just getting a dashboard view. It's really giving a dashboard view of where most of the time is going. So there's no judgment. It's really just looking at the facts and don't make it look prettier than you think it is. You know, just be truthful and just say, Ooh, okay, most of my time is spent sleeping or it's spent doing nothing, you know, non-productive activities or the activities, but they're not really productive. So it's important for you to assess and do like a gauging um, activity and just see where you stand on an inventory regarding your time. Okay. So I hope you're able to do that. So I was talking to a young um, individual and we were having a session and one of the things they said, Rebecca, I've actually observed that I am doing, I'm spending a lot of my time doing non-productive things. And I'm thinking like, wow, this kid is so smart because they're able to observe that for themselves. And I said, okay. And that's where with time management, we talk about knowing what you're currently dealing with. And then what you do is you try to kind of like work around it now to where we say, how do we start creating a, a meaningful schedule for ourselves? How do we prioritize? Okay. And how do we organize? So it's really about saying, how do we schedule? How do we prioritize? And how do we organize? So it's really about organizing our lives. And because life can just take over and go whichever direction that you end up landing at and because you just let it take you there so part of it is owning your time and time and there's this beautiful um friend that i had and i remember i was not checking up on them because i said i'll call them at the best time i'll call them at the best time and because i was saving time for the best time but who knows that we can't save time so we also have this dilemma with time we think always the best times we need urgent and need to be addressed so the first thing is understand what do i spend most of my time on and we have the same thing, right? Time is money. So if time is valuable, where is it going? So it's the same way we do a budget plan and we assess where our money is going and we're saying, but how come I don't have enough money at the end of the month? Um, where did it go? So the same thing with your time. It's good to just have a quick glance to see where your time is going. And that takes me to the issue of time wasters. Identify your time wasters because there are people who waste your time the things that will waste your time easily. So it's important to do that. And um, so I'm just my laptop. I'm a little bit worried that um, we're going to wrap up in a few minutes just before to make sure that my laptop is still got power. Um, so when it comes to time wasters, we need to make sure that people don't waste our time. You know, we need to make sure that we preserve our time, we own our time. So make sure that you put a schedule every day, maybe on the fridge door where it's visible, have a big calendar, have one on your phone, digital one, so you can see also what your activities are and try to prioritize um, what's important, what things can you put off. Um, for me, I'm an, an, I'm an entrepreneur, so one of the things that I might do is I might move a lot of my meetings for Friday. 
instead of having them spread out if the clients prefer to do that. Or I can try to have days where it's admin days and some days where it's meeting days so that I can act on those activities. And then lastly, be flexible. Allow flexibility in your time management. So that's what I want to leave you with so that you're wearing many hats, but be flexible and say, you know what? Even if I don't do this today, no one's going to die. I can come back to it. But sometimes we're perfectionists and procrastinators. And that's what also chows us on our time and we're not able to keep time. So then we're trying to do something so perfectly that we end up not spending too much time than required in um, executing on some activities. So any questions on time management before we close off? So someone is saying, I procrastinate a lot, it's bad. <laughs> so make sure that you keep your journal and write down maybe what causes you to procrastinate. And also, like we said, do the time pie chart to kind of assess and see where most of your time is going. Um, then you can be able to start tweaking that. And it's, it's, it's process, by the way, no one has this down packed, but these are tools to just help you to be more effective, to be more productive and in managing your time. So any questions on that? Because being perfectionist can cause us to just work on a report that was completed maybe two hours ago, but you add more hours just tweaking and tweaking and tweaking to a point where you don't even submit the project. So make sure that you're managing that. Please share the recording. I missed the first 40 minutes. Um, so someone is asking for that. We'll definitely do that for you. We'll definitely share that with you. No problem. It's being recorded. All right. So here on Own Your Crown, I'm going to hand over to Sophia and Tendai and, um, so that they can share. <laughs> Anita saying the enemy of perfection is good enough. Yeah. So then, so that's where it's like there's a dilemma between mediocre, is it kind of like shoddy work or perfectionist? So there's the perfectionist where it's like, okay, you know what? There's excellence and perfectionist. Think for excellence than being perfect. Because many times when you do something with excellence, it's got heart and soul to it. Um, perfectionist is just saying, you know, you get caught up in, you know, all the technical details to the point you miss the message of what you're supposed to actually deliver on. All right. So to Sophia and Tendai. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, everyone who joined. Thank you so much for everyone who was joining. Um, I think, I'm not sure if you answered, there was another question, I'm not sure you answered, was how do you find a mentor? Um, I see that people are having difficulty on reaching out to uh. a, if someone, um, especially uh, a woman within the industry they're working in, um, those are some questions that have popped up as well. Okay, great. So mentorship is very tricky. Um, so normally I always say, don't go to a person and say, please be my mentor right away. Um, the first thing you can do is connect with them. Hi, how are you? Sophia, I noticed that you work in the media industry. I'm really interested in what you do. Can we have a chat? And then you introduce yourself. And then Sophia shares a little bit about yourself. And then you might ask questions like, what's the, you know, you know, how do people get into that industry? And when you find that there's some rapport and you're getting along with Sophia, then you, you build that trust and say, oh, you know what, Sophia, after talking to you the last few times, I would really would like to, for you to become a mentor. So that's one area. Um, in, if you're, it's in a workplace, if you're sitting in a meeting, you see someone that you like, send them an email and say, hey, I watched your webinar yesterday. I really enjoyed it. Um, I, can, I feel like I can learn a lot from you. Please let me know if you have available time. I really would like to just um, pick your brain or, and give a specific feedback as to what you enjoyed about the talk, you know, your topic specifically on a and get a mentor. Otherwise, get referrals, ask someone to refer you to someone else. I've done that for quite a few people where they needed someone in a specific field and I would refer them to someone else. So then I would be mediating in the introduction. So I hope Anne's question. And, um, and the, it is intimidating, obviously, but until you approach the person, you'll never know. If they don't want to talk to you, you learn. And don't divulge a lot of your personal stuff initially, because sometimes you don't know what people's agendas are. So some people have also disappointed me when I thought they were a trusted mentor, and then I'd had to find another one.
had a question on, um, they wear too many hats. And so for time management, so sometimes also look at your calendar and see what it's filled with. Sometimes it's the children's calendar um, that fill, fills up our, our calendar. So part of the scheduling is just try to allocate um, time in blocks. You know, just try to practice it. It's not, it's not automatic, but start being intentional about it and um, allocating the right energy to the right activity as well. Be energy efficient and time efficient. So I'm writing a book on that. So I'll definitely share with you once it's done. It's really about being an efficient woman, especially with our time and our energy. All right, any other questions? Um, there's another question here um, from Anita where she says, how does um, one move from being seen as a doer to being seen as more strategic? I had a portfolio with mm. no, no staff support. So I do all tasks from strategy to implementation and operational. Wow. Okay. So the doer and the activities, um, so in the strategy. So one of the things that I had to learn was to train myself also to move from there. I remember getting feedback saying, Rebecca, you're just a manager. You'll never be a leader. And there's a difference between leadership and management. So management is just making sure that the nuts and bolts are continually um, oiled and fine-tuned. And then leadership is saying, I'm steering and seeing what's ahead. And I was listening to one strategic leader and was just saying, you know what, we the now business of today is about running management teams for the now, activities that are required right now, and someone who keeps looking as well towards the future. And then aligning that and being agile enough to adapt as we turn each corner. And that's part of leadership. So it's a new muscle that you're going to have to develop. Um, and part of it is also just getting someone who's very senior in the organization and kind of asking them to be your um, kind of like your, you bounce some things off them. So part of it is really read up on the company strategy. So whenever you do an activity in the organization, ask yourself, how does it align and speak to the strategy? What area does it speak concerning the strategy? Sometimes the strategy is about continuous improvement. So even though you're doing an activity that's required, but does it speak to that improvement element of it? Is it about profit sharing? Is it about new markets? So that when you are doing, people can still hear the strategy voice in the doing, that you're not just kind of like, you know, bogged down with the day-to-day -day activities. You're also thinking big picture. So it's important to articulate that. I remember when I was running a women's group, um, we used to do some activities. One of the things that I said, you know, the leaders are looking for sales initiatives. So let's start inviting the saleswomen in the organization to the women's group. And they can invite their clients to the women's group and let's make our content in the women's group more strategic for the business. So it's not just like, let's kumbaya and talk about our feelings, but it really became a more like a sisterhood and a tribe, even though it was solidifying the relationships, it also helped speak to the strategy. So it was almost like a win-win situation where you can actually still portray that you're a strategic thinker, the way you collab, the people that you network with, the ideas you bring forward, but still get the work. I hope that answered your question. Um, and then, so there's some people were asking if you can please repeat the wheel um, idea um, for like splitting up your time. Okay. So for your time, you can actually just put it in chunks. So you look at your day in 24 hours and then say to yourself, what percentage of time do I spend in different activities? Maybe 10% is spent on meetings um, during the day. 10% is spent on maybe just going shopping and cooking and cleaning. And if you have a child, maybe 50% uh, is the children. So just kind of get an assessment of how much time you're allocating to different activities that are typical for you, for your profile. And then see where most of your time is going. And then based on that, then you can see what can I do less of, what can I reprioritize and what can I shift? But many times you'll find people are spending a lot of time maybe on social media than they actually should. So they can still spend time in social media, but maybe just bring it down a notch because now you understand how much time is going there. Because many times we, we are kind of feeling overwhelmed and we feel we don't have time, yet we have not done a kind of a dashboard review of where our time is allocated currently. 
And then that gives you an idea of how to improve your time management. I hope that makes sense. All right. So, Thank you right. so Any much other questions? Um, to all the ladies that joined us this morning, I hope you guys enjoyed the session. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question that you urgently need to ask that is pertaining to today's topic. Anyone? I think also, even if someone doesn't get to ask now, they're free to send an inbox on Own Your Crown Facebook, right? People can also send yes. their questions, especially some people feel like they have a personal question concerning career. We've had people who sent inboxes on the face group um, inbox and we're able to respond back to them as well. So feel free to do that. Yes, to some of the ladies that joined the session in the middle, we will be um, sharing all the resources from today's session as well as a link to rewatch the video again if there are any um, points that you missed out or you'd like to recap on. And that's it on our side. So thank you very much, Rebecca, for being amazing as thank always. You. And uh, thank you, Sophia, for you know um, hosting us this morning. And we look forward to seeing you ladies again next week, Saturday, same time, same place. We will reshare um, the link to join that session. Have an amazing week, and I hope you all stay blessed. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So.